Thank you for coming to my talk. I appreciate you being here. Uh, we were talking about uh, like the booths at RSA. I'm fascinated with them, and I hear that there's two race cars in South, so that's what I'm gonna go look at. I don't even know what they're for, but I'm sure it's cool. Um, I love going here and taking all these pictures and sending my kids, and they're like, I don't understand what you're doing. There's like robots and all this stuff. Like, what does this have to do with your job? I'm like, I don't either, but it's cool. Um, uh, so th thanks for coming today. Uh, before we get started, I gotta kinda tell you why I wrote this, this talk the way it, I wrote it. Um, so as she mentioned, I, I, I'm a SANS instructor. Uh, I teach a class on threat detection. So it's a lot of like, here's the attacker and what they're doing and how to get the data and detect it, right? So it's that kind of thing. And invariably when we're having a conversation with students during breaks or something, and they're like, hey, I'm, I'm actually new to the organization, or they're standing up our organization, or we've been reorged and now we're doing this. And we're kind of like, we're already in the cloud, but the security function is kind of something we're building up. What do I do first from a security posture standpoint? And I'm like, ah, oh, man, all right, so you gotta think hard. There's a lot of like answers, right? So I give the worst two words you can give somebody when they ask a technical question. Anybody know what the worst two words are? It depends. I know I would say it depends. And you could see the look in their face. And they're like, oh, he's not going to tell me anything I can use. Right? Uh, and so I hated that question, and, or that answer. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to come up with something better. So I would, I would go and get links to things like the AWS well architected framework or the CIS benchmarks, which I'm a big fan of, or Amazon's, uh, so Azure's got their own security benchmarks. Um, Amazon has two, I think. They have like the, the uh, security control uh, maturity model. Uh, researchers like Scott Piper has created their own. There's all these very specific things you should do in your cloud environment to make it secure. And I would hand it to them and I'm like, look, you should start here and take a look. And they'd start looking and they say, this is great, but. And then after the but, there is, it's not a technical problem because it's all written there. It's a policy problem or a process problem or a people problem or, or resources or something else. It's, not, it's really just all the, the glunk we have to deal with in our day-to-day -day job. And so uh, I, I tried to start thinking about, okay, how would we approach this? And uh, I wrote this talk that's really kind of designed to take us through some steps of building our cloud security uh, program, uh, but to handle the it depends and the buts. Which actually, that sounds weird the way I said it, but you know what I mean. And so handle, like, kind of answer these kind of questions and walk us through it. So I'm going to give you um, some technical specific things I think we should do when we're standing up a cloud security program. But we're also going to talk about, like, what is the cost to the organization or where's the friction or where's the problems that we might have and kind of how to get past it. All right? Sound good? I hope so, because they won't let me change the slides. So that's what we're doing today. All right. So... Uh, uh, it's just a disclaimer that says, if I say something stupid, don't blame RSA. All right. Imagine that today is the first day of your new job, and you're a cloud security engineer, and you have been hired to, did you point at yourself? I'm sorry, he, he looks like me? Yes, you, today is your first day. And um, you have started this new company, and you are so excited. It looks so, going to be so great. You're getting all your kind of onboarding stuff, and you're talking about kind of the great job that this company does. And a couple days in, you actually start getting the keys to your cloud environment, and you start looking around, and you start realizing it's not as sunny and perfect as I thought it would be. It's actually a little scary. You're turning over rocks. You're seeing the worms. You're realizing there's things happening that I was not expecting. Everybody been in that situation? I'm okay, don't raise your hand because your boss might be here and I don't want you to get in trouble. Uh, yeah, this is probably happening at some point of in your job or your career. I hope it is. Honestly, it's more fun if there's things to do. Um, as a as security engineer or somebody who does this, who fixes things for a living, uh, it's really fun when there's stuff to fix. And so um, the reason why we're in these kind of situations is because every company is kind of on this like path for cloud security, okay? So you'll have some companies, uh, organizations like the federal government. I spent 20 years at the National Security Agency. You can't deploy anything unless you've been given uh, permission on exactly how to do it, right? Banks might be a little bit like that. So you have that kind of side of the spectrum. Is it more secure? Pro yes, probably. Is it great for innovation of a product? 
No, it's not. So that's probably not where we are in most of our corporations. On the other side of the spectrum, we've got the brand new startups. They're just throwing stuff at the cloud and they'll fix it later when they get bought, right? So when like Cisco or Microsoft buys them, then we'll just go and fix everything, right? So um, that's kind of the other side. You're probably not over here maybe, you're probably somewhere in the middle, right? I don't know where you are in that middle, but you've been hired at this company to get us a little bit closer to probably the middle, right? Somewhere in between so that you can do your job, but you can do it securely so you're not, you know, in the newspaper. That's kind of, or the, on, I guess on Twitter now, I guess, right? So that's kind of where, we, where we're gonna stand. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about kind of our approach to getting in this organization that has already got cloud stuff out there. The problem with the my uh, well-architected frameworks and all of that stuff is they're really written for Greenfield. You're not in the cloud, and this is how you're gonna go into it. That's great, you're probably not gonna be in that position very often in your career. All right, you're probably gonna be in some stage of deployment and you're gonna fix things while it's moving. We used to call it repairing the airplane in flight. That's a, I don't know if that's a government term, but we used to say that all the time. Um, so it's our first week or second week or whatever it is, and we have to make some decisions and start doing something to improve our organization. So uh, we have a choice, and this is audience participation time, just so you know. So it'll be easy, it's just raise your hands, that's nothing hard. Um, first thing that we're gonna do, we have a choice. We can either do something that's really easy or we can do something that's really important, okay? That's our two choices. So raise your hand if you think we should do something easy. Okay, maybe 25%. All right, raise your hand if you think we should do something important. Oh, okay, all right, uh, most people said something important. Uh, no right or wrong answers, but I will say for the topic of this that we're gonna talk about, I think we should do something easy first. Now, I'm cheating a little bit. The thing that I'm gonna suggest that we do first that's easy is also really important, all right? But even if it wasn't, I think we should do something easy first anyways. And here's what I mean by easy. Almost everything that I'm gonna talk about in this talk um, is a prescribed recommendation that's written somewhere that people have talked about. I'm not, gonna, I'm not giving you any kind of crazy new deployment methodologies that probably aren't gonna work in your organization anyways, right? I'm gonna be showing you things that people have made recommendations. So easy is not the technical problem. Easy is the friction it's going to cause on your organization. I'm making an assumption that your developers are deploying your production systems, okay? So we're, I'm assuming we're gonna make an assumption that we're all in the cloud, because that's kind of part of the, what the talk's about, and we are probably on some level having the people who build the things deploy it, okay? And that's kind of the DevOps model that a lot of organizations have moved to at some level. The cloud makes that super easy to do, and so that's kind of why we start migrating to that. So I'm making that assumption. All right, is that okay? Yeah, that may not be exactly where you are, but that's where we're gonna be talking about. Okay, so when I say something that's easy, I mean that it's probably gonna be a no-brainer to get permission to do it, because it's gonna be a you know, highly effective thing that we should do. Also, it's not gonna disrupt my entire organization from deploying production. All right, that's my idea of easy. What it's really is, is lowering friction. All right, so there's li little friction to these recommendations that I'm gonna show you on this, on this slide and uh, be based off of people, policy, and all those kind of things. All right, so three things I suggest we do first, and I'm gonna go through them one by one. The slide is uh, cloud agnostic. I will talk to you about AWS and Azure because that's what I know. I don't know cloud, uh, Google that often, so I'm not gonna lie to you by throwing out words that I don't use, so I'll just talk about those. Um, the very first thing that you, I recommend that you do on your first day or your first week is to go look at what's called activity logs in, in Azure, they're called activity logs. In AWS, they're called CloudTrail for some reason, I don't know. Um, I don't understand how AWS names things, right? Anybody AWS fans? Like Neptune, like what am I gonna, I don't know what Neptune means, right? So it's, it's a, um, uh, I, I do realize I work for GitHub, which is owned by Microsoft, so I, I'm not really making that joke because uh, Microsoft does some crazy, they change their names all the time, right? And that what their thing is? So at least Amazon keeps the name, and you're like, okay, I know what Neptune is, but Microsoft, this could be something new all the time, 
and uh, even I get raged on that. Okay, anyways, nothing to do with this hawk. Um, uh, sorry, this is what we just dive into this in my class, and we're like, what is this thing? We, it's a fun, what's this service really do kind of uh, t game we play. All right, activity logs uh, or an AWS, they're called CloudTrail. This is really the, the things that are happening against the management API, okay? So in my management API, things like creating virtual machines, creating storage systems, um, creating users, deleting users, deleting storage systems, all that kind of stuff, updating is going to be in our activity logs. In AWS, I'm also going to get things like reading what is the name of my storage accounts or S3 buckets. It's harder to do in Azure. That's one difference between the two. But in general, this is the most important log you should collect. And it's probably already deployed in your environment at some level. So this is kind of a no-brainer, low-friction thing we're going to try first. I'm going to show you why we're going to do that. First of all, our activity logs should cover the entire environment, all accounts, all regions, all the time. I stand on that hill, OK? Uh, it, it could be a, a lot of logs in places where you don't deploy. But I have seen attackers gain access to an environment and start spinning up crypto miners in accounts that are not being used. Or not accounts, but regions that are not being used. And they would not know that if they didn't have activity logs to look at it. So go and grab these from everywhere, turn them on, forward them to your SIM, wherever that SIM might be. So if that's Splunk uh, on-prem or in the cloud or whatever, it doesn't matter. Forward that stuff because this is the thing that your uh, detections are probably going to be built off of, but it's also the thing that you're probably going to be using first when you do an investigation. Okay, so those are the most important things. Um, in every one of these items that I'm going to show you, I want to test for something. Now, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Lean Startup. Anybody familiar with Lean Startup? I became a big fan. Only one person, that's it? Really? All these people at RSA? Because it's, OK. Um, well, I love Lean Startup. Um, it, it's really a, this methodology for figuring out like how to create a product that has market fit, and do people actually want to use it? As a software engineer, uh, I spent a lot of time building and deploying things that no one used, right? Because we didn't really ask the customer ahead of time good enough. Like, so it was fun to develop it, but no one used it. So uh, Lean Startup is really that idea to figure out what it is. And there's two things I take advantage of Lean Startup and everything I do. First one is uh, testing all your assumptions all the time and being obsessed with metrics. All right, so everything that I'm showing you, I want to pull data and I want to test some assumptions. You go into your organization, I'm going to turn on my activity logs, and you're going to go to the boss and say, I want to turn it on everywhere. And they're going to say, we already did. And you're going to say, great, show me. And what you're going to find out is that you probably do not have them turned on everywhere unless somebody was uh, managing a thing. Or what you might find out is that uh, back in, you know, four years ago when the accounts were set up in AWS, they were deployed a certain way, but now AWS has a new way of doing things and nobody transitioned over. So this is a good first case to go investigate, knowing your environment, understanding how logs are being collected and where to put them. All right, um, I'm gonna show you the diagrams for, for every one of these, for just for AWS, just because I had to pick something and I couldn't do both, we'd run out of time. Uh, in AWS now, I have something called uh, AWS organizations. AWS has accounts. Uh, you're probably going to have multiple accounts. If you started off as a small company, you had a single account, and then you create a whole bunch of more, and now your primary account is your production account, which is also your org account, and that's bad, but that might be where you are. That's just kind of the way things grow, right? Um, and so, but this org account allows me to federate uh, changing things across all the environments. So in my top org account, what I can do is I can say, turn on CloudTrail, collect all the logs, and send it to my, I don't know, storage account. That would be my recommendation. And then you can forward to your SIM or whatever you want to do in there. What's great about CloudTrail is that I can do that from a centralized location, and then every time a new account is created and added to the organization, it just turns it on for you. So you just turn it on, and then you can leave it, and you're going to check it every once in a while, making sure it works, but you'll get those API logs. All right, so that's my first thing that I recommend that we do. All right, second thing that is also going to be low friction is turning on my security tooling. Very generic term. I'm talking about things like uh, guard duty in AWS 
or defender. All the defenders in Azure, maybe. I mean, there's multiple defenders. Defender for cloud is the primary one, and that's what you can turn on. But these detection services may be on in some cases, but they're not probably not turned on everywhere, and they're probably not been um, configured to do all the new things. So uh, Defender has changed a lot over the last couple of years. We're making kind of a joke about that. Uh, Guard Duty has done the same. They keep adding new detections uh, that you can detect on, and you, if you don't have a security team that has been managing this, you can probably go and, and turn that on and look at it. The nice thing about these security tools is that you don't have to tell it where the logs are. It just knows how to go and get those logs, which is great. I, I'll be honest with you, I hate wrangling logs from one part of my organization to the other. It's not a job that I like doing. Uh, the team I work on at GitHub, that's part of our job, is kind of wrangling logs. And boy, it's great to just be able to turn on Defender or Guard Duty, and it just knows how to get the logs. And I don't have to write the detections for it. Uh, I get it. Now, there's, you know, we can have a debate about whether how well those things are detecting and how much coverage they are, but they're doing a pretty good job for this amount of stuff, and then you can add your detections on top of that. The big thing I want to do when I turn this on is, yes, I'm going to get all this tooling, but I'm also going to start engaging with my SOC. Do we have a SOC that is writing detections? What level of data do they have? Do they know what data they're missing? That's actually a big one. If you do not have a cloud security team and then you've been hired to come in as a cloud security person, right? That's kind of the, the storyline we're going with today. Uh, they may not realize that they're missing all of this data, all these things for detections. And so you can engage with them and go and turn those on. Uh, in AWS, um, I'm going to have guard duty, and I have it. I can turn it on in my main org account, and I can turn it on and say, look, I want you to turn it on on all the other accounts for all the different regions, and I want it configured this way. You can do malware detections where if your virtual machine has something weird with it, it'll actually take a snapshot and scan it. You got to turn it on because you're paying extra for it. So there's these other things you can add to it. I can go and turn that on at my org account, and it's going to deploy. And when a new account is created or a new region has something you, being used in it that didn't before, it's now got protections. It's all in place. The alerts go up to my main uh, org account, and then I can forward that to my sandwich. I'm just not showing you here. In Azure, this was a little harder until recently. Azure, you could turn on Defender, but you would do it at every like subscription, and then you'd have to go and collect it from all the subscriptions. Ugh, it's just a lot of work. But Microsoft recently came out with XDR, which can allow you to gather them all together to make it easier. Both AWS and Azure have been making changes to these core products to make it easier to create and deploy across all of your environment. Uh, it was not easy to do that before. And AWS especially, because AWS accounts are these security boundaries that are really uh, hardened. Well, I shouldn't say it that way. It is hard to go from one AWS account to the other. Like, you have to go log in to every one of them. And if you want to do something, you got to log into each one of them. And it is a lot of work, and it's a pain. So this AWS organization can make that easier for the things that work. In Azure, it's a little different. Azure, they have subscriptions, but the subscriptions are a little bit softer. You can kind of move around. And Azure has some services that already that deploy across the environment. So it's just kind of generally sometimes easier to do large-scale, multi-account uh, uh, federation in Microsoft, sometimes. All right, so that is our, uh, our detections here for our detections tool. So recommend taking a look at those turning those on and making sure that you have them across your whole environment. The last thing we would want to look at is our storage, not the last thing, the last thing for this section is our storage logs. Okay, this is things like S3, um, st Azure storage accounts. Every time someone reads and deletes and adds an object, it would create a log. That's a lot of data. And so this is where it doesn't really matter to me as much whether you turn it on or not. What matters the most to me is having the conversation to say, do we want to turn these on or not? I don't, it seems weird, right? From a technical standpoint, we like, we just tell me what to do, we'll turn it on, and then just move on. 
But this may be the first time you start having a conversation that says, how much data do we want to collect? Where are we going to put it? How long are we going to keep it? And storage accounts seems to be like a, a good one to have that first conversation with. Now, uh, you may say, hey, look, we're not going to turn on these logs because there's just so much of them and we don't normally use them. But if you've been breached, you've got your activity logs, you will see that the person went and they um, logged in, they looked at my virtual machines, they looked at my S3 buckets. Did they read any of the files? I don't know, because you don't have your logs turned on. So if that happens, the boss is going to tell you to turn them on anyways. So I'm just, you know, just telling you. Maybe you want to have that prepped and handy. Um, if this was a talk about like data collection and forwarding, we might have a conversation about maybe don't put these in your SIM. That's not as important as them being readily available somewhere, maybe in a storage account or S3 bucket, so you can analyze them later. Um, what we do want to do is we want to make sure that we have that ability to have that conversation with the policy decision makers and it is written in document that says this is the what we're going to do with these logs and this might be the first time you go and you get somebody to put something in writing because the other two things are kind of no-brainers this one we're going to go and we're going to go put it in writing uh, large volume uh, of, of data they're used infrequently we might want to delete them faster that's when you can start having the question of how long do we want to be able to go look back in time to see what's going on if there's an instant response. And we can go and investigate that, and we have to have that question. Six months? A year? I don't know. What's great about this is you can say, look, if you turn it on, uh, it will collect this much data, and we'll have to store it this much, and here's the cost. Are you ready to go? Can we, should we do this? Right. Uh, this is actually one of the places where AWS and Azure really differ and how we would turn these on. It is so much easier in AWS than it is in Azure. Um, in AWS, I have this cloud trail. I've already turned it on, right? Because this is where I got my activity logs earlier. And I can say, look, uh, this is deployed everywhere. Um, I now want to get my S3 bucket logs. Okay, I can just tell cloud trail to also collect my S3 bucket logs. And DynamoDB and KMS, and there's like a whole bunch of stuff that have all come out. Here's what's great about this. You have all of this stuff you've deployed and you can configure, right, in your cloud environment. What CloudTrail is kind of doing, this is how I mentally envision it, CloudTrail is saying, well, I, I know what you've deployed, I'm gonna go and get the logs from it. You don't really see, you don't have to set up anything other than at your top org level saying collect S3 buckets. It'll collect them from all S3 buckets in all of your accounts. That is super easy to do. It is like one click kind of thing, all right? It, does it increase cost? Yes, so you wanna be careful of that. You wanna think about how I'm gonna import that. But it's so super easy, it's just, just do it. That would be my recommendation, just turn it on. Um, in Azure, it's a little bit different. In Azure, I actually have to go and I have to tell every one of my stored accounts to go forward logs to some place. Now, what's nice about Azure is I have something called Azure Policy. Azure Policy is an ability for me to say, hey, this is what I want this storage account to do, and if it's not like that, go and change it so that now it does what I want it to do. So you can create a policy that says send all of your logs to this other storage account, and then if it's not like that, make sure it's turned on and it will go and turn it on and it'll do that. And if I go and deploy a storage account and I didn't follow the rules, it'll fix it for me within like 20 minutes or something like that, which is super cool. Actually can do more federation across my accounts in Azure using the Azure policy than I can in AWS. So AWS kind of created an easy button for us to do that. All right, okay. Uh, the, one of the reasons why I say that these are low friction is because you, if you've been given permission to do this, which I assume you have, you've been paid to hire to do this, you can go and do this without asking for anybody's input on the dev teams. Like, it doesn't have anything to do with the dev teams. Does that make sense? I'm turning on storage account logs. I mean, that just gets turned on, especially in CloudTrail. They have no idea that you're collecting the logs. They have no idea that you have turned on guard duty. It doesn't really interfere with their work at all. So those are all really great ways in which I can go and kind of uh, 
implement some things, low frictions. While I'm doing that, I've tested my policies, I've tested my environment, I've understood whether we have documented and implemented our security posture correctly. So now I'm gonna to move to something else. I'm gonna do something that has really good security and a little bit more friction. And so what I'm gonna do in this time is I'm gonna look for things that I can do that has me interacting with my developers or the product team that does the deployment, whatever they are. I'm, we'll call them production teams, if maybe. But I'm gonna interact with those teams and I'm gonna have a conversation with them. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do stuff that's kind of pretty easy for them. It's, it's not like go and redeploy all your applications with this new baseline image, right? That's hard, that's a lot of work. And even if you say you're gonna do that, you're probably gonna have um, you know, some time it's gonna take them more to be able to do that. All right. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just gonna shut some stuff down. <laughs> is this a security requirement? I think it is. Because if you have systems out there that um, are not being used anymore, but they're just been left, they're not managed, they're not patched. Um, if um, you know, so S3 buckets would be a good example. Now when you deploy an S3 bucket, has encryption turned on by default? That was not always the case. And so if I have stuff out there that's been out there for a long time, it does not have the proper security controls in place. So I say uh, now go and start turning stuff off because you can go and interact with your dev teams to say, what is this? Why is it deployed? It hasn't been used. Do you really need it? Can we turn it off? All right, so that's a really good en engagement tool. Also, it'll save you money so that you can show how much money you saved and then how much uh, you save, well, so let me say, if you're turning on security tools, that's gonna increase your cost. If you're turning off resources, that'll decrease it, so maybe you can actually save some money. That, that's kind of a, a ploy I use. I try and turn stuff off at the same rate that I turn things on, uh, just, to, just, to, just to so I can tell them, hey, look, it's not gonna cost you anything. Um, the real big reason for doing this, though, uh, you know, it, unmanaged stuff, is, it can be dangerous. Um, uh, save money, but I really feel that if you have less gunky stuff out there, it's going to be easier for your CERT or your SOC teams to be able to do an investigation. There is nothing harder than doing an investigation saying, this virtual machine looks like it might have been compromised. Who owns it? And it was somebody who left the company four years ago. And you're like, do we need it? I don't know. Um, you can turn it off and see if anybody screams. Anybody done that? Done that before? Found a server in a cubicle office, like under a desk. Anybody ever done that before? I have. It's a lot of fun. You're like, all right, well, I got to pull this cable. I don't even know why this computer's here. Um, and you find out it was used as a heater for somebody, and they, so they didn't say anything. Anyways, um, turning all this stuff off can make it easier. It also allows you to start investigating your environment to see where your core problems are. If I have a lot of products out there that are unpatched, I can start asking some questions. Why? In a non-threatening manner. But the biggest thing about doing this is to start testing your ability to detect who owns stuff. Because you're gonna need that for your stage three that I'm gonna be talking about. Who owns these things? How do I know who owns this stuff? Now, in all of the benchmarks and frameworks, what they're gonna tell you is use tags. And they'll say, tag your resource with the owner and then it, all your problems will be solved. But if you walk into a cloud environment that's got 2,000 virtual machines running, none of them are tagged, how do you start? Like that's not, it's an easy technical thing, but it's actually a really hard thing to do from an implementation standpoint. So, um, yeah. So if I'm gonna go start doing this investigation, uh, I can start figuring out who my ownership is and I can start working with my organization to say, we need a better way of tagging and enforcing ownership of my resources. Also, this is probably gonna start off as a manual process. You're gonna message people in Slack and say, is this yours, is this yours? That's not a business you wanna be in. And so you're gonna start building your process to do automation to tell people there's a problem with your resource, you need to go and fix it, all right? That is a lot of work. Um, it can be automated, but the only way to automate it is if you have properly tagged everything, so it's kind of a circle. All right, so um, how do I know what I can shut down? Uh, there's a couple of different ways that you can tell. Um, you can see the CPU utilization. You can see if that utilization is really low. 
Um, I know in AWS, if you have uh, an enterprise level account and you have people in AWS that you work with, they'll set up something called Trusted Advisor, and it'll actually tell you what is your biggest waste areas. Like it'll, it'll create this kind of board across all your environment. Here's the biggest places you're wasting stuff, and a lot of it is virtual machines that are not used, or um, storage accounts or S3 buckets that have data that nobody's reading from. You can go and detect that kind of stuff. Um, what is, if you have said everything has to have an ownership tag, then you can go and look and say, what doesn't have an ownership tag? Let's just turn off and see if anybody screams and do that kind of stuff. Um, this process of burn down seems easy, but it is, actually takes a lot of time and a lot of communication with your dev teams, with your organization on what the new process is gonna look like. And so you're gonna learn a ton about how well your organization handles security making changes to the environment. Some places, uh, not all, maybe not yours, but some places product teams have been running without security involvement for a long time and now things are changing. And so, or maybe you've added more people or now you've gotten uh, a new CEO who wants to have things more secure. I don't know what it is, but you're gonna have to change that dynamic and both teams are gonna have to start figuring out how to work together to do that implementation. And this is a good first start for that. All right, the next thing to do is kind of like shut down resources, but it's for identities. Uh, one of the three major ways in which an attacker gains initial access to a cloud environment is through an identity that either has bad passwords or maybe um, a credential of some kind that has been accidentally leaked, and that's usually kind of one of the ways they can get in. Uh, there's a lot of identities that you probably have in your environment that you should not have because no one's using them. Uh, it is quite amazing when you do like research, people have done research on like user accounts and they have found that like large percentage of the user accounts have never been used. Like they were created for a purpose and then no one, and then it was abandoned or whatever, or maybe for people and then the people never used it. Most people in your organization and your company should not have admin access to your uh, cloud environment. Right? That's just kind of, it seems like a no-brainer, but that you actually might have too many people with those kinds of uh, uh, accounts. So go and clean up those identities. Figure out who is being, who's out there that should not have an account. Um, figuring out um, if there's resources that are over-permissioned. I have a virtual machine. The virtual machine is on the internet. Should that virtual machine have read-write access to all of my storage accounts? No, they should not. Um, but they might because that's how it was kind of set up in the beginning. So kind of kind of think about that. How, what systems have too much privileges and how can I go and uh, maybe kind of uh, change that? Also starts leading us to how things are getting deployed. If you work in an environment where um, all of your IAM roles, whatever cloud environment you're using, uh, are set up by a centralized team, and if I'm the developer and I have to go to the team and say, hey, I like this, uh, this new role, they're gonna go create the role. I'm probably not gonna wanna come back to them every day as I'm making tweaks, and so I might just ask for just give me star. That happens, I've seen that before. So um, I wanna kinda try and reduce those. The other thing we wanna look at is cross boundary. Now, boundary can actually mean a lot of things, um, it's, there's no kind of specific uh, terminology for what a boundary could be. A security boundary is kind of like, this is the area in which I, I'm gonna put stuff in, and I wanna control how it talks out. So in AWS, um, accounts are a very solid security boundary. Like that's built into place. In Azure, that subscription is a little bit softer, but it's still a security boundary. Inside of a subscription, people, usually developers are just doing stuff and you're not really controlling what's happening inside of that subscription. So look across your, your um, cross-boundary access. Do virtual machines have access to other services and other accounts? Do I allow uh, cross-tenant access in Microsoft's Azure? Those kind of things you can go and do in your investigation when you go and look at your accounts. What I'm testing for is my security process for changing and deploying stuff. Because now I'm telling developers, I need you to make a change. I need you to reduce the credential. I need you to not use this 
uh, same IAM role for every virtual machine you ever deploy. These things need to be deployed separately. Now, uh, the specifics on how I can kind of do that is very detailed in all of the security um, um, uh, frameworks that we talked about in the beginning, right? So it's all there about different methodologies of how to approach this. For instance, if I was using Terraform and I was using an AWS, uh, I could say um, I want a virtual machine, I want an uh, S3 bucket, and that virtual machine can talk to the S3 bucket and nobody else. I can lock that in with how I deploy it. But I don't know how you deploy your environment, so you have to kind of take those and implement them in your own environment. So. How can I kind of do this by looking at my environments? Um, I, in AWS, I have uh, the best tool that I know of is the last use date. So in your credentials in AWS, it will have a property that tells you the last time it was used. So I can use my posture management systems, whichever system you might be using, to go and analyze and say, if I have a system that hasn't had anybody use it in three months, should we just delete it? Yeah. Not four months, I don't know how many months, but some number of months, so you have to make a decision, but you can do that on the posture size. AWS also has a tool called the IAM Access Analyzer. Uh, what it does is it will look at a role that you have created or want to create. Uh, oh no, let me rephrase that. It looks at a role that's already out there, and then it looks at all the activity that's happened over the last you know, few months, and will tell you, does this role have more permissions than you've ever used it? I think it's a great, service and tool for developers to use to make sure that they've clamped down on their services. In, ADA, in Azure, uh, I have sign-in logs. So every time a resource goes and says, I'm gonna do something, it has to do a sign-on, I can see that constant role for my sign-on. I can write queries in KQL or whatever it is I'm using to go and determine when's the last time this identity was actually used and maybe go and lock it down. Little bit harder for me in Azure to go and determine when something was last used than AWS, because AWS is making that a, a property in the posture. And posture management kind of stuff is a lot easier than activity analysis, just in general. So just to make one thing that I think Azure, uh, AWS does a real good job there. All right, uh, last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at, uh, for this section, is gonna look at sensitive data. Okay. In like the uh, security, what's well, Azure, I always get the name wrong, AWS security uh, maturity model. I think that's the right name. I, I don't know, it, one of the, it's, it sounds something like that. It specifies you should have data classification, which means if I have sensitive data, PII data, then the resource should be tagged to say this is where your PII is. So when you have an investigation, your cert team who doesn't really know what the environment looks like as detailed as the developer, they can go and look and say, oh, someone's reading from this, has PII. This is a higher priority than maybe somebody reading like a website uh, data system. So uh, the biggest problem though is where is my sensitive data? I mean, I can determine that I have a service or a product that has sensitive data and that's its database. And so I might be able to make that connection for easy stuff. But what about the database logs? Are they being stored somewhere? Do they have sensitive data in it? Like it, it, it can become more confusing. Do I have stuff that I didn't intend that has actually been leaked into a storage account that I didn't really remember? Um, so going and figuring out what that looks like can be really difficult, but the real difficult problem is having that hard conversation about what is sensitive, how should I treat it, and how am I going to create security boundaries around my secure environments or my, my uh, PII or sensitive data so that it's monitored specially and I make sure I monitor and manage the access to it. So that testing your, your what now we're doing is we're testing appetite for something that's harder. Because what I'm probably gonna do when I do this investigation, I start analyzing everything, we're probably gonna have a conversation with some developer teams and say, you gotta change the way you do things. All right, and that is not a, I mean, that's, what we, that's our job, but we're gonna start having this conversation one at a time with these organizations. In AWS, I have something called uh, Macy, uh, which I like Macy, I don't know. I, um, I have some people say it's really expensive, and yeah, but uh, I don't know of a better tool to do this kind of thing. What Macy does is it'll analyze your storage accounts and will detect PII. And you can also create your own 
um, you know, kind of identifiers inside of MAAC. And it will constantly monitor the storage accounts or the S3 buckets to determine did something new get dropped in that is now sensitive. I like this. Um, there is not something like this in Azure I know of that does at this level. Uh, there are some tools that you can use in Azure like Cognitive Search, which are really kind of a little bit complex. But also third-party products will do this kind of stuff, like Wiz, I know Wiz does this kind of thing, and there's a bunch of other ones that will analyze your storage accounts and kind of look for data. One thing that Macy does is Macy can look at all of the files in your storage account. Uh, most of the other products will do some kind of sampling. This will look for all of them. So uh, I recommend in your production environments, turn on Macy, because you might find you have PII in places that you did not expect. All right. For our last section, we're going to hit something that is hard. Hard means higher friction. Um, this means probably changes to an environment. And this, 10 minutes left? OK. OK, all right, good, thanks. All right. Um, luckily, there's a clock up here. So that's, I didn't, I, really, I just found it. I was make sure it's the right time, too. Um, I woke, so I'm on East Coast time. And I woke up this morning. And my clock said nine o'clock, and I flipped down. Like, oh my god! Oh, it's just inset. I just inset it back from <laughs> from uh, East Coast. Um, okay, so I'm going to do something that's harder. I want to do something that's measurable. This is where I'm going to start taking real big changes in my cloud environment to try and get me to the next level. And the first one is deploying guardrails. A guardrail is uh, not a detection. This is my. I, I mean, I, this is how I'm going to explain it, but. Um, a guardrail is not a detection, it's not an audit, it is a blocker or a change or something. So I think of about bowling, right? So bowling, if, if you, you don't want to get a gutter ball, you pull up the guardrails and you can't get a gutter ball, right? You have to work really hard at it. Um, so I'm going to pull up those guardrails and I'm going to make sure that somebody cannot do this thing I don't want them to do. This is a hard conversation you're going to have to have with your entire organization because maybe they were deploying uh, S3 buckets that did not have encryption, and you're going to say, nope, no more of that. And now that's going to change the way some people operate. Okay? We, as a posture management environment, we want to get to guardrails. If you're in an organization where every developer is deploying things however they want, you're going to have a harder time to get to the guardrails. If you work in um, you know, federal government for 20 years, the guardrails are easy because they won't let you turn on the account without all these guardrails in place. And that's just kind of the approach they have. Uh, or financials would be a similar situation. It's not bad or good, it's just kind of a different approach. All right, so my guardrails are gonna block. Um, it does require a lot of key planning. The hardest part of it is the communication. So implementing a guardrail in, in Azure and AWS is not technically hard, but the, uh, implement, the communication and getting people to change, is, it can be harder. Um, what we're going to do with this one from a testing standpoint is we're going to try and turn on a guardrail that maybe seems low impact, uh, and we're going to turn it on and we're going to test and say, how did it work? Did, did people, were people kind of cool with it? People move in the right direction? Good. Let's turn on a harder one and a harder one and a harder one. Um, one of the things that uh, I, I didn't mention before, I should have in the beginning, uh, part of the topic's on the flywheel. Everything that we do here is a test to see what the next step looks like. And so implementing an easy guardrail might get us to the next step, to the next step, and it starts going faster and faster and more and more secure. So before I had uh, the very first set of slides, I had just the uh, one person was able to do things. The second group, it was the, the person, you, and your product teams. But now you're going to have to go to somebody who's going to say, yes, this is the policy we're going to enforce for the entire organization. This is maybe like the, the C, uh, CISO or something like that. I don't know whoever's going to make the decisions in your environment. In AWS, I have something called the service control policies. Service control policies allow me to say, don't allow somebody to turn on a virtual machine if they don't have the ownership tag attached to it. And it'll just block it. All right. Um, I could take that ownership tag and I could say, uh, don't turn it on unless somebody's do it. But if, maybe I want them to turn it on, but I want to make a change later. In Azure, what I, or at AWS, what I can do is I can use CloudWatch to say, someone turned something on, but it didn't have the ownership tag. 
okay, I'm going to use AWS config to respond, and I'm going to write a, a, a Lambda function to go and put the, flat, uh, the tag on it. So I, I have the ability to do it. It's a little bit of work, I'll be honest with you. So there's just a couple of things you got to do and kind of pull it together. And Azure, Azure has something called Azure Policy, which I mentioned earlier. It actually can do all that for you in one service, which is actually, I find really nice. So in my uh, Azure environment, or my, my AWS environment, according to the slide here, I'm going to set service control policies. I'm going to specify, hey, I'm allowed to deploy an S3 bucket uh, on the internet, but only in certain accounts, like let's say in the mar um, a marketing account, right? Production account, nope, can't have a storage account or an S3 bucket sitting on the internet. It's basically a web server. But marketing, that makes sense. I'm going to do that. All right. Second thing I might do is uh, doing, uh, looking at changing the way I deploy my virtual machines. Man, I've, have you ever worked in an environment where you were in charge of patching like your systems? Have you anybody worked, done that like you for the company? A couple people, yeah, it's because it takes like two weeks and then it's time to do it again. Like it's just all the time. I don't want to do that in the cloud environment. What I want to do instead is have a base image, patch that, and then just redeploy. That's a change in the way developers are going to operate. They may change the way we consider monitoring, managing, and deploying things. But that's the right way we want to be able to go. We're going to do that with containers. Let's just move that to our, um, our virtual machines. Um, by doing this, it improves our ability to uh, do a remediation. If I know this virtual machine has some weird activity, I, I can just stop it and it'll be replaced, and then I can go and investigate it. So I have some, from a security standpoint, I have some new things I can do. But what I'm going to basically be testing is my ability to automate deployments through infrastructure as code. And if you're in a very click, click, click through the GUI environment, you really want to get people to infrastructure's code with whatever process you want so that you can automate how things are being deployed in this environment. All right, so I've got my golden image. Uh, I'm going to do is say, hey, look, I'm going to redeploy. What will happen is I can just start pulling virtual machines off and redeploy from my golden image uh, one at a time. Last thing I do. now. Uh, this is not the last thing I would do, but the last thing I'm going to talk about uh, in this presentation. Because next, you do you got to figure out what the next thing is. But the last one I'm going to talk about is network protection. And the reason why I picked this one as last, even though network protection seems like something we should do early on, but network protection networks look different in the cloud. I have more tools than I ever did in my on-prem environment, and I have different ways of thinking about things, especially in AWS. Um, Azure feels a little bit more like they support a lift and shift, especially if you're a Kubernetes environment. Uh, AWS is kind of like, you should rewrite all of this. <laughs> you know, that's just, I don't know, it's just kind of the feel I get from the two organizations. But network protection uh, looks different. I might want to be gathering network logs. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Network logs can have um, a good place if you're doing investigation. But if you turn on Defender or CloudTrail, they do most of the initial detections for you. But there's things like private endpoints, um, uh, Azure's Bastion host, these other services that allow me to manage my environment without having it on the internet. And that's different feel for developers, especially in our world where most people are working from home, uh, that are doing this on a day, or at least at some point of their week, they're at home. So being able to do things like private endpoints, um, setting up virtual networks that are completely off the internet, having Bastion hosts that are managed by the cloud provider, feels and looks different. And so that's why I put that kind as last, because even though technically it's not hard, it is a massive change to our environment. And so what I can do is I can move things off the public and in, uh, private internet and then put a load balancer in front. And now none of my virtual machines ever need to be on the internet again. Whew. That would reduce my tax service, wouldn't it? All right. So um, just to kind of wrap this up, um, build your flywall, uh, flywheel plan, knowing that I'm going to make a change, I'm going to test, it's going to get me closer to the next step, and I'm going to keep pushing that flywheel till we move faster and faster and faster. Um, audit and measure everything that you do, and make sure that things are done on a repeatable basis, right? So if it's great if you did it today, but you're going to leave in, in next year, you want to make sure the next person who comes in can handle it. Find your friction points. Uh, Figure out why there's friction points and try and build technical and policy uh, solutions to get around those friction points. And then test, adjust, and repeat. All right. Um, did I go to time? Yes. So I, no time for questions, right? 
We have two minutes, so if anybody has a question, you're welcome to ask a question. I'll also hang out in the hallway afterwards, uh, but just to let, you let you know, I have a, a hyperlink that has this information, so you can go online and kind of look at the things in the slides. So, yes, sir. Hey, how you doing? Um, so we have a major, you know, almost all of these guardrails and security um, uh, controls in place. We're all AWS shop. Um, right now, as a CISO, I'm having a hard time justifying the ingestion of logs yeah. within our development environment. Because right now, we're giving the agility to the developers to create quick POCs. Um, but the ingestion of all these logs from a development environment is yeah. becoming too much. So what, what is the best practice? So or have you heard this? I don't know. So best practice, I don't know, because people have all kinds of opinions about develop, uh, developer logs and whether you need them or not. Developer logs are like, it's not production, I don't care. But also developer areas where the scariest stuff can happen because people are just trying things. I recommend maybe not bring it into your main sim that's on-prem, but store the logs locally in the cloud environment and then using something like Athena or Data Explorer and Azure to go and analyze the logs if there's an issue. Yeah. All right, I think that's time. I'll be hanging out afterwards. I also have lots of stickers, so if anybody wants a sticker, come say hi. All right, thank you.